This morning, I'm going to start with a story. I think you've all heard that before. An old man was on his deathbed. He called in his pastor, his doctor, and his lawyer. He said to them, I want to take my money with me. I'm going to give each of you $30,000, and I trust that in my coffin, you will place that money with me. So at the funeral, each man came forward, placed an envelope in the coffin, and said their piece. Riding away together from the funeral, the pastor suddenly broke out into tears and confessed, I have to tell you all, I only put $20,000 in his coffin. The church needed $10,000 for a new roof. Well, since we're confiding, the doctor said, I only put $10,000 in. You see, the hospital needed this piece of equipment and it cost us $20,000. At that point, the lawyer, the lawyer was aghast. He said, I'm ashamed of both of you. I want it known that I put the envelope in the coffin and I enclosed a check for the full $30,000. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Most gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I pray on this nice and sunny Sunday that it is well with your souls. Whatever is going on in your life, what's ever brought you here this morning, it is a good and great day to praise our God, our God of love and hope, who welcomes you in love this day. Set aside all those cares that you may have had and become present here, present with our God our God of glory and majesty, this God of ours who is worthy to be praised. From the beginning of the universe, God intended love. Those who study the creation of the universe, uh, they're called cosmologists, not cosmetologists, cos cosmologists. They tell us that the, the way the earth was formed, the conditions had to be perfect, perfect in temperature, perfect in timing, to, to be able to sustain life on this planet. From the very beginning, God was creating, not just for the sake of creating, but God was creating for our benefit, that we would be here, having love in mind from the very beginning. Scripture further elaborates on what kind of God we have, a God who is infinite, all-knowing, a source without a source, Immutable, never changing, self sufficient. God doesn't need human beings, but loves us anyways. God is omnipotent, all powerful, able to create the universe, all living things, all the things we see, all the things we don't see, all the things we're still yet to discover. God is omniscient, all knowing. In Isaiah, we read, Quote, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Unquote. God is omnipresent, able to exist in all places and all times. In the Psalms we hear, quote, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me, unquote. God is good and wise and merciful. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness, we hear from the Psalms. One of my favorite adjectives about God, God is mysterious. When asked by Moses what God's name is, God answers, I am who I am. Don't you just love that? Totally evasive. 
our God. The Israelites called him Yahweh, which means to be. In one moment, God can be a pillar of fire, the next an angel that wrestles with Jacob. God will be who God will be. And God can do whatever God wants. Aristotle called God the most unmovable mover. He argued there is always change in the universe and in the world, and we observe that there is time where change, and where does time and change come from? That there must be some substance, God, in the universe which keeps things in motion eternally. And so this substance itself must be eternal to do so. We could go on and on about our God. But in the end, what can we say? There is no other like God. No other. And yet, this God, who is so much more than us, so much more than human beings, seeks and wants a relationship with each of us. Isn't that amazing? Relationship with us as, you know, us failable, many times selfish human beings. The only thing we can conclude is that God must love us. John Wesley described God seeking us out and desire to be in relationship with us as prevenient grace. The grace of God that precedes us knowing that God was even pursuing us. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. From Ephesians and from Romans, but God proves his love for us in that we still were sinners, that God loved us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We believe and know that this grace is for everyone. God does not hold back this provenient grace, this love from anyone. There is no other like God who gives all without reservation. We, though, are not like God, obviously. We are created in God's image, but we are finite and limited and have difficulty in seeing others. All sorts of situations, our human, human centeredness causes us to leave others out. In this morning's pericope that Kelly read, we hear a story about leaving others out on the outside. The ongoing story of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, and Ishmael. I continue to be amazed by these Old Testament stories, by their depth of meaning, uh, just the storytelling pizzazz that they have, the fact that um, although told for many uh, generations and then written down by the Israelites, many times God utilizes those from outside the Israelite community to tell us who God really is. People who are not Israelites or the chosen people, but outsiders who introduce God to us in a new and different way. So last week, we heard from Pastor Lloyd about Sarah receiving the news of her pregnancy and giving birth to Isaac. But before we kind of dig into this week's scripture, we need to hear the whole backstory. Several chapters before our scripture today, uh, we hear in this narrative that Sarah is told Abraham will be the father of a great nation. But she knows she can bear no children. She decides to enlist Hagar, and her Egyptian servant, to bear Abraham a child. Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn. Sarah's decision immediately haunts her. She sees what this has done for Abraham and the joy and the status where Hagar has been lifted up. This creates jealousy and animosity that will continue throughout this story, a problem for Sarah of her own doing. When she hears that she finally will bear a child and bear a son for Abraham, she laughs, more like scoffs, maybe that this is gonna happen. She doesn't initially believe it. 
Eventually, Sarah becomes pregnant, as we heard last week, and after giving birth to Isaac, she laughs again, this time with joy, and names her son Isaac, which means one who laughs or rejoices. Now today, Sarah isn't laughing anymore. Some scholars say that the older Ishmael is laughing at the toddler, Isaac, and Sarah is not amused. She sees where all of this is playing out with Ishmael, being the oldest of Abraham's sons, and she's not going to let anything or anyone, the least of an Egyptian son, be the heir in this family. Hagar, the Egyptian, and her son will no longer be part of this family, this community. Sarah may think she has removed them from God's plan by making them another. But as we know, God, as usual, has plans that we can't see. This is not the first time that Sarah has tried to get rid of Hagar. Earlier on, before today's passage, Sarah also cast Hagar out while she was pregnant. When she did that, an angel of the Lord, or God in the form of an angel, spoke to her. Because of this interaction, Hagar calls God, E-L-R-O-I, Elroy, or God of seeing. Even though she's an outsider, an Egyptian in the house of the Israelites, she has her own relationship with God. We might be tempted to think people outside this church, our denomination, or Christianity are outside of God's grace as well. They are not. God is working in the lives of people that we don't even know. Hagar and Ishmael are sent out, but once again, God intervenes. God tells Abraham that Ishmael will receive the same kind of blessing that Isaac is, that a nation will come from him as well. Then God helps Hagar to see a well in order to survive. Even when we think people are outside of God's good graces, they are not. Hagar sees who God really is. Do we? Do we see that God does not treat God's children as others? That we are the ones that create division, us and them? We cannot limit God's mercy. God hears the cry of the abandoned, hears the cry of the outcast, outcast, and God saves. Southern Baptists, <clears throat> at one time in their history, like Sarah, brought women into their midst to their forefront. In 1964, the first woman was ordained in the Southern Baptist Church. By 2017, nearly 2,500 women have been ordained 174 of them as pastors. As their roles increased, the conservative wing of that denomination started to push back in the 1990s, claiming that according to, to scripture, the office of pastor is only limited to women. A couple weeks ago, the Southern Baptist Convention ousted five prominent Southern Baptist churches including Saddleback Church in California, for having women in pastorate positions. To them, these women are like Hagar, not called to be part of God's plan, and are too easily cast out, them and their churches. I am, for one, so glad to be a part of the United Methodist Church that continues to declare its belief in the full equality of women and the importance of women in decision-making and leadership positions at all levels of the church and has done so since 1956. I think pastors like Mary Catherine Miller who steered this church through the COVID pandemic or Reverend Tina Blake before her or others, Reverend Isabel Gardner who served this congregation and still others in the United Methodist tradition like Reverend Karen Tunnell, Reverend Cheryl Jensen, Reverend Karen Bunnell, Reverend Ker Jennifer Kirby, who hired me at Habitat for Humanity, Reverend Connie Hastings, who supported my deaconship, 
Reverend Mary Brown and, uh, and our very own Reverend Chelsea Spires, who have all encouraged and inspired my faith journey and my journey to becoming clergy. May we all continue to recognize and value all the women who bring to the church, whether they be clergy or lady, the leadership and values that they bring. No one should be left out of what God is calling them to do and be. With that said, we are not all the way there in terms of being a fully inclusive church here in the United Methodist Church. Based on our book of discipline, the full rights of gay clergy to be in relationship or the right to marry a same-sex couple is not allowed. And due to the difference in our theological interpretation of scripture about homosexuality, the United Methodist Church in the U.S. is splitting apart. Let me affirm that this congregation, many years ago, joined the Reconciling Ministries Network, whose mission is committed to intersectional justice across and beyond the United Methodist Connection, working for the full, participa full participation of all LGBTQ plus people throughout the life and leadership of the church. We need to keep living into that mission, church. As we continue to fight for the rights and inclusion of all of those who are marginalized or harmed, including by our actions, our inactions, or our polity, we should not become like Sarah, though, and cast out those who are at odds with us. God's love knows no bounds. We, like God, cannot we, like God, can act out of love for all, even those who disagree with us. Because of the church's disagreement around this particular issue, across the country, conservative churches, the United Methodist Church, have been improving at their church's car charge conferences their desire to leave the United Methodist Church. Once they make that decision, then they need their annual conference's approval. Three weeks ago, the Peninsula Delaware's annual conference was held, the conference that our church and our clergy all belong to. The clergy and lay delegates at this year's conference, among other agenda items, approved the disaffiliation of 92 churches from our conference, about 23% of the churches in this conference. A very sad day, but an inevitable day given the conflict that we've all been having. The split in the United Methodist Church mirrors the rancor that is in our politics in our country right now. Although there is contention around this issue, I want to lift up our bishop, Bishop Latrell Easterling, because at the conference she began with a message that set the tone for the rest of the conference. She said that as Christians, our work is all about love. That even in these times, where there is what she called reactive polarization, meaning where I'm supposed to hate and denigrate those that disagree with me. We as Christians don't have to behave like that. That we can witness to something different when in conflict. We are in fact called to love as living examples of Christ's disciples. As we began the business part of the conference, where there might be animosity, she reminded us all there of our Christian calling to love by saying, quote, we're gonna be loving and respectful of one another. We're here to holy conference and we will hear and listen to one another and engage with one another and do so in love, unquote. After the vote was taken and those churches were approved for disaffiliation, a liturgy was shared. In the liturgy were these words shared back and forth between the churches remaining and the churches that now have left. Quote, ensure and certain hope of the resurrection and eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to the Holy Spirit our siblings in Christ, unquote. We may not all get along. We may feel threatened by opinions, stances, beliefs of others. And yet we can still pray and love those who do not agree with us while still being true to who we are. Yeah. Our God is like no other. 
and loves and welcomes everyone. God desires that all might come to know how deeply cared for, deeply cared for they are by our Creator. Is there anyone in your life that you know who may be feeling left out, that has been othered, someone who needs to know that God and you loves them? Let us be like our God and let them know that you see them and hear them and love them. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Now please stand and body your spirit for our hymn 357, Just As I Am.